and welcome to today's Water Cooler Chat, where we talk about all things Live Peer, whether it's orchestrating, delegating, broadcasting, transcoding, or anything to do with the Live Peer ecosystem. We are here to ask questions and get answers. Um, so yeah, the uh, the topic uh, obviously top of mind is probably the price algorithm. Uh, so we can jump into that very shortly here. Uh, I do want to get the uh, a couple uh, DAO and Treasury items out of the way first, um, just uh, just to get those out of the way. Because the price algorithm can probably uh, take up quite a bit of time. So, uh, first off, uh, the Live Peer Innovators DAO. Um, just looking for feedback on the website. I've I've gotten some people that have gone through it and uh, and done some uh, some uh, spell checking and, and things like this. So I'm, I'm glad people are are paying attention and uh, and giving me some feedback. So I'm going to go through and, and update that. Um, in the meantime, I believe we can go ahead and and say that uh, submissions are now open. So I would like to organize our first um, DAO meeting. So I think maybe I'll have to, I'm thinking Tuesday, maybe tomorrow, uh, around the same time as a water cooler chat, we'll do like a 15 minute or a 30 minute meeting where we can get some members together and start assigning roles on reach, doing outreach for getting people to um, submit for their project for round one. So. The idea would be to make sure we we don't miss anyone who has ever built anything on live peer and we can um, make sure they get um, acknowledged for for what they've done so uh doug says where is the lid website it's livepeerinnovatorsdow.com you can head there and uh, check out just uh, version one like i said there's probably still some spelling mistakes on it gotta go through and fix that up um but does yeah does tomorrow um around this time 3 p.m eastern time work for people that are here uh, that are in the DAO. Does anyone object to it? That would work for me. I mean, I'm... yeah, no, 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 that's fine. I'm just not going to be available tomorrow. Sorry. Yeah. Well, like I said, it doesn't need to be a long meeting. Um, it would just be nice to get a few people together, and we can start just assigning roles. Um, we can even do it through just. It, it, yeah, it won't take long, but uh, we can start just uh, yeah assigning those administrative roles. So that's all I want to say about that. Um, does anyone else have any questions on the DAO or anything around that so far? Uh, this is Marley. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yes. All right. Thanks. Um, my. Um, initial gut reaction on the DAO is that um, I think that there needs to, my feeling is that there should be another layer of um, voting, if you will. Um, I think that uh, in kind of a, the spirit of a, uh, the whole live peer community, I think everyone that's contributing to uh, the uh, the treasury that is going to be doled out to anyone that uh, receives a grant from that treasury, anyone that is putting you know their LPT in uh, should have a voice in where that goes. And uh, it doesn't look like that exists right now. I think that um, there's a a good way to um provide that with still um leaving you know some responsibility to the innovators DAO members which is a just a subset of the whole community to vet people and make sure that it's worth opening up to the whole community to vote on yeah so uh, like the whole community does technically vote when they when we go to fund round one. Um, every token holder has the ability to either, you know, agree or disagree to fund the applicant or the the, the round one itself. Right? It's just the DAO that puts together the list of people that are deservant of it and weights them based on their contribution. So, um, yeah, it's kind of how it works. What what would you recommend we do um, when, in terms of like ensuring that people have a say into who gets awarded? 
Um, well, maybe it just needs to be, um, you know, more clearly defined on the Innovators DAO website because uh, the funding model graphic that's out there um, it seems to me that it doesn't really um, reflect what you just said. Oh, okay. Um, how how would how did you read into the, the 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 graphic? Like, what was your interpretation of it? That uh, it was just members of the Live Peer Innovators DAO that would have a vote as to how the money that was collected from the entire community would be granted. No, it, like the Live Peer Innovators DAO doesn't have any control over treasury funds, right? Like it has zero control. All it does is we put together a list of people that we think deserves the funds and we we weight them based on how much they should receive. And then we go to the treasury, which is the, the Delta proposal, and we submit our proposal and get the all LPT holders to agree or disagree on whether we should fund this, right? And that will come out of the treasury if it uh, it gets passed. And if it doesn't get passed, and if the if the live peer holders feel that it's unfair, then we can easily the live peer innovators now can go back, rearrange things, take into consideration what the community wants done, and then reapply, right? So all right, perfect. Then then that's exactly what I want. Yep. Yeah, no, the 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 Live Peer Innovators now has absolutely no authority over the funds. Uh we are simply just putting together a good case as to who deserves it and then applying to the treasury for that. So, yeah, every token holder gets a say in whether, you know, we're doing a good job or not, right? I think that's exactly what you should put on the website right on the homepage. Because this was confusing even for me till you spell it out right now. Okay, yeah, no, that's absolutely. Like I said, ChatGBT wrote most of that website, so you know, do have to go through and and comb it a bit. So it it doesn't know, you know, what I'm saying. And and, and you're right. Like putting across that information um, is not obvious, right? So um, yeah, I'll this recording. I'll literally go back and and try add that into a section on and where the funding comes from and how it works, right? And so that it's fair. So hopefully, Marley, that uh, that answers your question. It does, thank you very much. Cool. Okay, awesome. Uh, so yeah, that's the Live Peer Innovators DAO. That's, that's some really good feedback. I'm gonna go through and, and, uh, and add that in there so that it's clear as to where the funding comes from and how it's fair for everyone and how you can have a say whether you're just an LPT holder or whether you want to become a part of the DAO, you can also apply to become a part of the DAO so that you can have greater control into um, to your um, opinions on who, who, should, uh, who should be receiving these funds. I fully intend to. And, you know, I was thinking about, well, you know, it's like what I'm, you know, what I thought I was proposing was different than what I read. And I still wanted to propose it even though I sort of felt like it might not be working in my best interest, <laughs> it's, but it was, it's in the best interest of the whole community. Mm. Absolutely. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, that'll be that. We'll go through. If there's any more feedback, please DM me or, or put them in the, in the discussion and we can kind of keep improving the website so it's, it has correct information and, and it's easy to read and understand. Okay, um, let's move on to, again, just the, 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 the Delta proposal. Let's move on to that topic. And then uh, obviously the pricing discussion following that. Uh, Doug, do you wanna give us uh, a quick update on the Delta proposal, what's happening with it? And yeah, the, the latest and greatest. Yeah, sure thing. Um, yeah, exciting moment. The um, Delta proposal, which creates an on-chain treasury that we were just talking about got voted on, um, it, it, there was two LIPs, they both passed voting um, last Wednesday, I believe. The creation of the treasury passed almost unanimously with over 99% uh, of the voter uh, stake voting to create the treasury. The, um, the proposal for populating the treasury with 10% of the 
protocol inflation was um, you know, a little more controversial. It had a lot of no votes. It passed with 80% of the stake that voted voting in favor, about a little over 20% uh, voting no. So I think it's it's good that there you know was some debate and, and people were able to, to weigh in and express their, their opinions, but it still passed. That was deployed um, on Thursday. Um, and as soon as the next round ticked over, the treasury started um, populating with 10% of the inflationary live peer token. So um, I think I checked this morning, there had been uh, maybe five rounds that had passed since. So almost 5,000 tokens worth of LPT are sitting in the treasury. And there is a, um, a new user interface on the live peer explorer where people can make proposals to the treasury and people can vote on, um, on those proposals. Um, I believe that any, um, so it, it, backing up one second, in order to, for every um, token holders of voting power to be registered on chain, they have to take some sort of um, bonding or staking action, and then uh, their stake gets snapshotted. Basically, that needs to happen before they're eligible to vote. Um, and there is a transaction, I forget what it's called, it's called like claim voting power or something. Uh, but there will be a big sort of orange pop-up on the Explorer um, on all pages in your account pages which prompts people to do that. Um, I believe when orchestrators make their first reward call, I believe their stake is, is snapshotted um, automatically and they don't have to take any manual, manual action. And similarly, any bonding, unbonding, transfer bond um, action should also um, snapshot people's stake. So I'll, I'll share a little post about that um, in the meantime as well. And uh, otherwise, yeah, Delta is open for business and we have a lot of work to do to build uh, tools around it so people can view and see what's going on in the treasury, make sure they're aware of proposals. Um, you know, exciting to see the, the innovators DAO begin to form and plan for, um, you know, preparing their first proposal to the treasury. There's a lot more um, groups that probably should form and, and be catalyzed, like uh, groups that maybe focus on liquidity and L1, L2 bridging, which I know is a need. Um, groups that maybe think about additional uh, sort of incentive programs outside of just what's in the protocol, maybe even related to some of this, uh, you know, pricing feedback and how that affects orchestrators, profitability interim, that might be interesting. So anyway, a lot of, lot of potential now that there's, um, you know, about a thousand live peer token a day flowing into the treasury that will be available to fund um, all the things that we could use and, and see built in this ecosystem. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. Uh, does anyone else have any comments or questions on the treasury or the proposal? I will say that I, I did use the, the, uh, the, uh, Arbitrum, uh, uh, test net the go really test net treasury um, and it was a pretty smooth process I, I did successfully uh, send a proposal uh, voted on it won it uh, executed it and it worked very smoothly and it was quite intuitive so pretty excited for it now being live on chain so uh, yeah just my just my small amount of testing on uh, on test net was uh, was quite uh, positive I have two two things to say. Um, first, congrats, Doug. I know this is your vision and come realized. So you had been thinking about this for a while. So it's finally here. So congrats. Um, the the second part is perhaps maybe we could have a water cooler where Victor can walk us through some of the steps he took and you know some of the challenges and hurdles as he looked at you know modifying the live peer smart contracts deploying them walking through that whole process i think it'd probably be a pretty interesting story to hear that's a really awesome man i'm sure he'd be I'm sure he'd be up for that yeah that's a really good point we'll get him uh i'll dm him see if we can get him on for next water cooler chat and uh yeah cool we should all encourage him to one, o one other thing to add is um yeah you know, i was hinting at all the stuff to be built but you know all the tools that we use are our node software, the Explorer and stuff, you know, have been iterated on for five plus years that this protocol is live um, to get to the current level of polish and UX that it has today. Like this treasury and the management over it and everything is, is brand new, right? We don't have all the tooling 
around this. So if people see opportunities for uh, little utilities, dashboards, um, you know, monitoring tools, these sorts of things, feel free to make any grant, um, you know, quick grant applications. Would love to to fund some of this stuff getting uh, built out early on. Most definitely, I like it. Where could we reach out if we wanted to to collaborate or or ask for requests for things to be built? Um, eh, the Discord is always is sort of the the hub, right? So whether in the um, the governance channel, uh, it's probably a home base for a bunch of this discussion, or even in in general. And then the um, you know the grants GitHub repo is uh, sort of where where applications typically flow through. Cool, cool. Okay, any last comments on Delta or the Live Peer Treasury? Okay, great. Well, let's move on to the topic of the hour, uh, which is the price algorithm update. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's jump right into it. Uh, the first person that uh, that kind of talked about it was Papa Bear, and uh, yeah. Let's uh, let's let Papa Bear introduce the topic and uh, start us off. So take it away. Um, no, I mean I I, uh, I I thought you brought it up first actually, but um, I was just curious just to hear what people's uh, ex experience has been. It seems like there might have been a uh, maybe a change in the, um, in the uh, selection um, after the initial rollout. Um, I noticed that using a, a really low um, price per pixel was getting tons of streams coming in, and then that seems to kind of stopped. And at this point, I'm a little lost on <laughs> what works better or worse. And I've been like kind of tweaking things up and down, and uh, can't really put a lot of uh, I don't I don't have enough uh, uh, time behind it to really uh, have any like hard conclusions on what what seems to work best, at least for for my particular node. Yeah, I can, I can only speak to what, I mean, we've all kind of observed over, over the last, um, I guess it's been almost a week since, since it went live, but it seems like the race to zero price per pixel happened a lot faster than uh, a lot of us thought it would. I think some O's are experimenting with like, like close to zero. Um, and at first doing that, it seemed like tickets were coming in a lot faster and price per pixel wasn't making much of a difference, but traffic was definitely coming into nodes with a lower price. Um, and then it, something either changed or a lot of orchestrators put their price lower and now tickets are, are quite slow. Um, so I, I think there's definitely some tweaking that needs to happen so that it's not so heavily price centric uh, because I, I experimented with a very low price, got a ton of streams, but obviously uh, with that low of a price, you're, you're not going to get a lot of payments or tickets. So um, I boosted one of my nodes yesterday back up to, I think, either 200 or 400 price per pixel, and it's my main node, um, and that just doesn't get streams now. So I think there's some balancing to be done there, and I'm, I'm curious to hear what other people have experienced. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll share my experience a little bit. Uh, and for those that you don't know, uh, last week, I'll quickly uh, tell you, last week there was an update to include price as a weight as to how many streams you would get. And so therefore, the, the lower the price, the more streams that you would be eligible to, to receive uh, in the selection process of streams being distributed. And so... Yeah, the idea would be we would take away the randomness factor, which was 30% of all streams just get randomly distributed amongst all orchestrators. And the idea was, you know, it was it, it created a healthy, healthy ecosystem of orchestrators to test their systems and get involved. And 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 uh, and uh, and so it wasn't just stake weighted. But uh, so, yeah, we eliminated that and then went with a price pricing model. Uh, which in theory will allow the free market to kind of now dictate the actual price of per, per pixel that that an orchestrator is willing to to accept, and because prior pr uh, previously it was just kind of um, arbitrarily set to 
1200 for live streams and 900 to VOD based on the largest broadcaster that was their preset settings. So we all kind of migrated to those prices based on, you know, how much how much work we kind of wanted. But now we we have this ability to lower our price and and receive more streams. And so my my experience was the first day it went live, I wanted to test uh, uh test some demand. I wanted to see if my systems could handle some demand. So I lowered it to 89 way per pixel. And I immediately shot up to uh, about 80 or 100 streams, uh, which then broke some of my orchestrators. I hadn't actually tested. Uh, th these are my standalone orchestrators for the people in the pool. I started running out of memory and, and having all types of weird little issues. And so I like within 12 hours, everything had kind of broken and and I had to turn stuff off and uh, recalibrate and try go back up to, I think I went back up to 900 temporarily until I, I fixed things again and so the next day I said okay well I, I couldn't handle 100 let's see if I can handle 100 again so I dropped it back down to 89 but I think at this point a lot of people had also dropped theirs the second day and um, I, I could only get up to about 20 25 streams again so I, I couldn't actually retest all the things that I fixed uh, so 89 it was now competitive so then I dropped it to zero for 24 hours just to see if that would get me back up to that that amount and I got up to maybe 30 streams and, and then I went okay uh, people have moved down their prices it's now become competitive so after that 24 hours of just testing some stuff I bumped mine up to 400 way per pixel, and that's where I sit now. And then, um, but that's just for the Live Peer Inc. broadcaster. My public uh, price per pixel is 49. And the idea is if people want to use the, the, like, if we get new broadcasters coming in, I'd rather give them a discount. And then the Live Peer Inc. broadcaster, I just have a set of 400 because that's what I'm willing to pay for that sustainable work. But at 400, I don't think I'm getting any work. So this is kind of... I also, I just want to add to what you were saying, Titan. Um, it's not just price-based, though. It still does consider stake, and um, that is a variable amount, how much is stake-weighted and how much of it is um, you know, uh, price-weighted. Um, so it's uh, just something to consider for people that are, aren't familiar with uh, the changes or who are just listening in. Um, Which means if you're if you go down to a certain price and your stake is low, it may or may not give you work because both factors are at play. So, you know, the 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 larger the stakeholder, the lower their price, it becomes very difficult then at that point to get. I, mean, I wouldn't say very. I guess it's variable. So there's still some variability in there, but you should see some more work go to the larger stakes. Yeah. So, and, uh, Hunter, I, I don't know if you can speak, um, but is could you either confirm or deny that there were any changes made uh, during last week? I mean, I know originally you guys uh, you said that you were going to uh, be playing around with it to see what works. Was there were there any changes made last week, or is it just uh, no, people dropping no, it down no to... changes have been made since the initial rollout. Okay. So it must be that just everyone dropping their price that's making that difference. Good to know. That. I would also know uh, one one factor that hasn't been discussed here is that there is at the lower end, like within the price weighting, there is randomness at the at the bottom. Um, so it's not simply like lowest lowest price, highest stake wins. Um, there there is a bit of randomness uh, after that 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 filtering is done. Wait, can you explain how that works? Um, just um, I, I, I don't want to butcher the exact implementation, um, and there, there okay. is a Jupyter notebook that does it. But the gist of it is that um, the like after the price and stake weighting is done, and the performance filtering is done um, amongst like the lowest like five or ten um, O's in that that are that are remaining, uh, there is randomness to choose amongst those. Um, okay, so similar. Sorry, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, so, go ahead. I was just gonna say, so it's similar to like um, 
the way in the past where once a, um, a, a pool was made, then there was some randomness out of the eligible orchestrators that fit the criteria um, on who actually gets chosen. I mean, yeah, yeah. So the, the 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 rationale is just that, like, if you had an O with like the highest stake and the lowest price, you don't necessarily want the, for the resilience of the network. You don't necessarily want them to receive every single stream. Um, that's probably not the best for uh, quality of service either. Right. No. Okay. I got it. Um, and that makes sense. That was actually a question I had was um, how how that part of it works once the the um, you know you get down to like okay these are the work for I, mean, I assumed it wasn't just like okay it's all the work's going to go to whoever has the lowest price and the stake waiting comes out and picks this person it's just that's it i figured there was going to be a group and then um selected from that group and um i just wasn't sure how that worked so um that's good enough just to know that it's a, something of a random selection after the uh, initial selection And so, a uh, hunter. This is, I believe, the first rollout was for VOD only. Is is that still the case? Um, no, it's it's so so within uh, the first like twenty four hours. I think we did did VOD and and then live like twelve or sixteen hours later. Okay, so so yeah, live streaming. So everything is on this new pricing model right now. Yeah, yeah, and has been since um... Tuesday. Yeah, like October 9th or 10th. Right, right. Okay. No, no changes since then. And it, there was a like a, a 12 ish hour staggered rollout um, for bot and live, but no changes since then. Right. Um, I mean, sorry, nice so to have uh, Veres in on this conversation to see what experience and thoughts he got. Um, is how does performance like is performance the biggest factor right now in the in the selection algorithm or is it, or is it even a factor performance is a limiting factor right so if you don't so, meet certain performance thresholds you will not be considered for like phase two of selection so wouldn't it make sense though for the reliability and the performance of the network right because that's i mean any broadcaster coming in is going to be looking for the most reliable service right um that's like i could pay whatever but if 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 i'm not getting performance or reliability out of it then i'm it's not going to you know maintain at a at a large scalable level but like we we put all these other factors in front of performance and th they are important right but like the thing is right now everybody's dropping their their stuff down to zero because that's heavily affecting their stream count um you know people are going down there's there's like 12 people below 100 uh, price per pixel and it's and it's dropping you know basically since there is no bottom besides zero it's just pushing everybody back down like when you guys came out with vod that was you know that was different and and this whole this whole change in the pricing it's good it allows other broadcasters to come in and say like you know that we're looking for a specific price and then people can accommodate that but like for live peer being the main uh platform if you just if you don't set a, a bottom on there a bottom that you guys are, are deeming to be acceptable it kind of just makes everybody like it, it's as far as the orchestrating side of things it's relatively chaotic right now right because what do i set i don't know what to set if me set it i mean the whole fact of that um tickets coming out are are based on probabilistic micropayments and it's you know we have randomness on that side and then we really don't know when we're going to get a ticket if we're when we're transcoding normally, but then on top of that, we're dropping our our price per pixel way down, which increases that that time frame between tickets. Like it's it right now, it's very chaotic, and I think rolling out um, rolling that out without it, like a, a a bottom. It's it's on. I, I don't know how to say it. it's like it's uncomfortable. It, it doesn't it it doesn't really make sense to me. Yeah, thanks for thanks for sharing, Ryan. Like, I think it's um, I think it's important to remember this is very early days, right? Like, everyone is reacting. Um, everyone in this like open marketplace is reacting to this brand new big change, which was just made, and it's like not at all surprising to me that like there's an immediate like quote unquote like 
race to the bottom, but like it also won't be surprising to me at all if there is a like some sort of like snapback over a little more time towards some some equilibrium because again if the quote unquote bottom or doing this for for nearly free is not sustainable for everyone who's actually like doing uh hard work in order to provide like a high quality of service here then the quality of service on the the network to the broadcasters would suffer um which is like you said not at all tolerable and so they'll have to pay a higher price in order to get uh that that guaranteed quality of service and eventually what happens is you find some like market coordinated equilibrium price uh, i also think there's plenty of like catch up to do in terms of the surrounding tooling like i think i've seen this community already start to take actions there like write scripts that update prices um automatically based on what they're seeing in the marketplace and how many um streams they're seeing and and everything um, which is is great. I'd imagine like the tooling evolves. Uh, two more quick points. One is if I think if you set some sort of guaranteed pre-communicated like uh, price floor, if you will, like if Studio just says the price will never drop below 400 price, uh, way per pixel or whatever, then we haven't learned anything like the market doesn't actually adapt everyone just reverts back to setting their price right at that right at that point and all that is is like you know live peer studio like fixing and setting the price on the network which will just lead ultimately to like inefficient um use of resources for for all around and then to your point about like well things have changed a lot like how you know how would we cover cover costs i think let's remember like the lpt rewards are actually meant to be this like useful bootstrapping tool that helps cover node operator cost um, during the like bootstrapping of demand on the network. And so, yeah, it may, may, may require like a new equilibrium. It may require like a new provisioning of resources to be profitable and effective. It may require, you know, an equilibrium of adjusting like reward cuts up um, if you don't have the ability to, to adjust your fees up. Right, but those will all like play into finding this like equilibrium market price, which ultimately is what like Livepeer's great promise is that it will be the most cost effective video infrastructure network uh, because of all this, um, you know, it's open marketplace of idle resources that can be available. So anyway, lots to lots to digest in there. I just wanted to share a few thoughts. I, I think, uh, and just a, a something to take note on, like. Um... I know Marco Marco has a dashboard that can like that pulls in say like the average uh price per pixel across all the orchestrators right and like right now the explorer page is a little kind of hard to decipher like what everybody's setting without having to go into each and each and every single one of them um which I think could kind of quell a little bit of the like uh I I don't know what to set and people you know not everybody's you know going to go into each and every single orchestrator just to find it they're going to check a few and try to set those and see if they work and it's a lot of guesswork that's in there um so any kind of like uh transparency to the averages or trends because i mean i know you I know you had a mentioned oh a trend chart on on even uh on price per pixel like that stuff would be good but if if that's something that could get implemented or you know i think that would be, go a long way to help it even normalize um, what people are trying to set. And the other point was also that there's a, the, we were talking about, there's a slight fear on, you know, because a lot of people have gone like global with their orchestrators right there. They have GPU servers in Frankfurt and Singapore and London and, you know, LA and all that other stuff. But then with the, the reducing this, this fall off on pricing, um, the sustainability of that, well, might you know we were thinking it, it, you could also see a retraction where people are going to start pulling out of those regions um, entirely and maybe start running their own home-based you know GPU inside of a, a computer back to like when the beginning before everybody started spreading out, um, which we were just discussing might be like a repercussion or the uh, a reaction to to this implementation. Is um Marco's tool not meeting your your need or your request for a um kind of snapshot view of the pricing across the network it it is it's just not like a 
I don't know how publicly available that is to everybody or if he wants it to be that uh, or something, but I mean, it, it is like something like that to be visible, especially like on the Explorer side is would be very useful. I mean, I, I would assume you guys have all that data since you have it in the Explorer. Um, and basically it shows, you know, price per pixel yep. distribution and the averages and who has what set and it's a pretty digestible. I just, I mean, I just don't know how I don't know if I should even be saying that I have it, but like it's just that I, you know, it's public. I, I mean, he posted it publicly, it just just so okay. you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, sorry. Yeah, um, I mean, but that's just people on Discord. Yeah, it's on, it's on awesome right here. Right. Um, but since you guys have the data, like you know, you guys have a lot of information that's on that that dash that uh, Explorer page and everything. This would be like getting some visibility, especially now that there it's it's such a pivotal. Uh, aspect of of trying to run like a, a node to to build that in would just be a, a suggestion of mine that's all yeah yeah to totally fair request i mean i would definitely recommend filing just um an issue on the explorer repo just so that it's in the backlog there uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of issues that came up for for delta that are waiting for people to work on them too so it might even be a good use of like a grant or delta funding to get some attention on like the next iterative updates here Price per mm -hmm. pixel used to be a part of the Explorer before uh, the Arbitrum migration, so it's there. It's it's just on the per. Oh. It's on the profile page. Oh, that's right. Uh, but yeah. it used to it used to be listed differently, though. It used to be listed, I think, um, as its own column. Yes, yeah, it's call. Yeah, exactly as a column, which I'm not looking at the Explorer right now. But, but like when you did like the overview, um, it was like. Uh, it, it was just one of the columns in there, like uh, where I guess it like, you know, over like or, uh, currently it would be like, you know, maybe after trailing ETH fees or somewhere in between there or delegated stakes. I want to bring up one point with the with the price per pixel and Marco's dashboard and, and especially the average too, because just to remember, it, it is quite highly manipulated in a way like like I had Live Peer Academy set at zero for about 10 minutes and then it went offline. But the the dashboard still shows it, it was at zero, and I thought, uh oh, it's probably giving people the indication that it's actually online and accepting zero. So therefore, people should try and match that. And I thought, well, that's bad optics. So I yeah. I spun well, it up for ten minutes to to turn it up to ten thousand way per pixel, and now it's at ten thousand, even though it's still offline. And uh, I think that's brought up the average, right? So no, he actually. I think he only does the average between one and uh, two thousand. If you hover over the little information thing on there, so right? He, so he, yeah, he, he thought I was about that. Say, yes. the, the top person there is like twenty two thousand three hundred seventy six price yeah, per no, pixel. It, so it, that it would be a huge outlier. PPP, yeah, so yeah, only considers PPP from one to two thousand. But so, but that's uh, not even that's not even a node that's active, right? Uh, right. So so just be like. Uh, just because a node is on there and it says it's a price per pixel, it also doesn't mean it's online. So uh, there's that. And that also doesn't, uh, that's only the public price per pixel that the that Marco's node is willing to accept. Um, I was like, for optics, you could easily just find Marco's price per pixel broadcaster node, ETH address, and change that to 1200 to mask, you know, what you're actually charging. Um, and, and, you know, so just the, it, it's, it's uh, like for Titan node specifically, it's just not accurate, right? It shows 49, but that's not what I'm charging, right? So mm -hmm. um, just uh, take it with a grain of salt because uh, yeah, it's just not perfectly accurate, that's all. Gotcha. Yeah, but but I, th I think what Ryan said makes, makes sense from just the point of visibility because I know this is, posted on the on the discord but i don't think every every orchestrator really knows this uh, dashboard exists and it'd be nice to have the price per pixel on the dashboard along with the ability to sort of scroll and see uh, you know history in terms of you know how, how much when and how much did the orchestrator change the the price per pixel to win when i so i i just want to note that i I do think that the availability of this kind of information, uh, while it's super helpful for orchestrators, is pretty unique in most competitive marketplaces, right? Like uh, most businesses simply need to assess their costs, the revenue they're able to bring in, and make appropriate pricing decisions uh, accordingly. Um, so 
I, I just wanted to put that on the table. Um, I, I think that like there's obviously an advantage to be gained from looking at this information, but fundamentally the business model of an individual orchestrator kind of comes down to you know, the, the business that they're able to run. Yeah. So what are you suggesting? What, what's to be gained by not putting this on the Explorer? I'm, I'm not clear, but maybe I don't understand what you're saying. Trade secrets. No, I, I mean. Yeah, I, I'm suggesting that like this is fundamentally a competitive marketplace. And like, yeah, I, I don't think that there is much to be gained by not putting it on the Explorer. But I also don't know that it is like the critical input to orchestrator pricing decisions. Right, but but unlike any other business that you like you suggested, they they don't exactly make their prices public. But this is on-chain information, and it is truly public. So what I mean, I don't see the point in, in hiding it. It would just this, be, this one's not. This one's just, kind of just interesting. Just, the price per pixels, uh, the price per pixel is actually not on-chain, right? It's negotiated um, between the the B and the the B and the O, right? And so we're just looking at data that's reported by sort of like one one data collector, right? In this case, you said it's it's Marco's node in the Explorer. I think, what is it? The, um, is it the test, the stream tester that collects this information? Is that right? Um, on the Life Your Studio side, yeah, I think it's stream tester. Yeah. yeah the, I, I, so so the, the other thing about the, the price per pixel being displayed on the, um, the, the Explorer, for my opinion, first off, it, it creates a lot of clutter for people who are trying to be delegators like as an as an orchestrator i don't go on the explorer all that often like I, I would assume delegators are more used to using the explorer so i'd like to keep the clutter down for for delegators to have a better experience and second of all the the price per pixel again like i said is not on like doug was saying it's not on chain so whatever you display on the explorer is subject to the broadcaster that's asking for that information so depending on what broadcaster node you are and what location you're in you're going to get a different price and i'll give you an example uh the price per pixel for titan node in north america is going to be very low because we have so much supply but the price per pixel for titan node in sao paulo is going to be quite high because we just don't have that much supply and so depending on what broadcaster you're asking for the price per pixel, you're going to get routed a different price. So it doesn't give you a very good example of actually what, you know, like now you have to set up multiple regions to ping each node to figure out what price that area is, right? Uh, this is all off-chain data. So just that, just to keep that in mind, like it's a, it's a lot more deep than uh, than just one price globally on chain. I see. I think what what confused me was the fact that you can pull this uh, price per pixel up using the live peer CLI, and for some reason I thought that's why it was on chain. Uh, yeah. Well, that's that's actually just asking the node that the CLI is connected to on what price per pixel you're brought you're broadcasting. Got it. Got it. I mean, if it's not on chain, I mean, I don't I don't have any issue if it's not posted on the Explorer. Yeah. My mistake. Because if, if we used Brad's uh, tester uh, to assume those prices, well, uh, I'm at zero across the world for his tester because I like using his tester and he requires me to be at zero to use it. So he has a different, his node has a different outlook on what the price is versus what LivePure Inc. versus what Marco's node is getting, right? So. Yeah. So is that where we segue into attestation from the tester? Uh, I think we're going to keep going on the price topic for just a bit longer because I think we want to make sure we're fleshed out uh, any comments or, or uh, ideas around this topic. So but we'll get into that very shortly, Hedrick. I, I was really curious about the effect of the size of the stake on the price pool dynamics. Yeah, that's a good topic. Hunter, do you want to quickly uh, talk about the the weights that are being used, uh, the stake versus the, the price of weighting? And um, kind of maybe some design choices around the the initial implementation of it. Um, are there specific questions about this? Um, 
I, I, I'm not sure if I, if I want to get into the, like the specific weighting here, um, but I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about the selection algorithm in general. Yeah, um, I think everybody here uh, who just went through the experience of, as, as an orchestrator with uh, the setting of the price um, and, and the way that, that adapted the overall pricing activity on the, what, what everyone was just describing, which is mostly focused around the concept of changes in the, in the price level or putting in a, a boundary on the price dynamic. Um, but I just note that from your Jupyter Notebook, uh, Hunter, that there's another dynamic, right? There's, there's actually two. Hunter, I'm sorry to interrupt, but is there, could you, uh, is there an effect on your microphone? It's really hard to understand what you're saying. Sorry. I, I can switch, switch to a different microphone. microphone. Give me one second. But mainly it is that the stake is another metric which impacts the variability on the price. And I wonder uh, if you've got any observations on how the stake size impacts price uh, volatility or visibility uh, in the network. Um, I can elaborate a little bit on the, like the rationale for having stake in, in, involved there. I, I think as everyone in this room has probably noticed, uh, it's it's relatively heavily weighted towards price. Um, I think that's you know, that's contributed to a lot of the conversation today. Um, you know, the, the the rationale for for stake is of course that there is economic security to choosing orchestrators that have a lot to lose, right? Like uh, at some point, I think the expectation is that slashing will be introduced. Um, but m more generally, there is security for a broadcaster in in choosing O's with with high stake. Um, so, so there is a balance, and that's that's why you know we didn't want to take stake out of the equation entirely. Um, but I, I think you know one of the most pressing problems that this these election changes sought to address was concentration of streams in high stake. So obviously the the weight of stake has been decreased quite significantly. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question at all. Um, so what you're saying is that there was a dynamic that played out over the course of the recent change. I have another question or just a thought. Was, is there any thought or is it possible that maybe in the future that um, performance can be considered an inclusionary um, uh, f uh, factor in selection. And the reason I bring this up is I think it would be nice to incentivize um, high performing orchestrators and try to make sure that they continue to um, offer service on the network because um, it tends to cost more to operate a, you know, a higher performing orchestrator. And um, I think it would be good for live peers, you know, future to make sure that those orcs stay around and don't, uh, you know, shut down because it doesn't, it's not economically, uh, you know, viable to keep some of these uh, O's up and running. Can you describe uh, what you mean by that? Uh, well, like, maybe just I, like throwing in another, like another weighting that, you know, maybe like if, uh, you know, for like, uh, for like, uh, um, instead of it like being just exclusionary, where like, what is it, if you're a, um, uh, above point, what is it, point six five to you're then included, maybe it was like if you're, um, you know, uh, I, I don't even know exactly how it worked, but if you're just maybe I think at a certain level, saying, you get a little, yeah, a little bit more weighting more for factors, it. right? Like download speed and your transcode speeds. Like if those numbers are collected over history, you could see that there's certain certain GPUs running out of data center where you're going to get that instant speed, you know, for for running streams that you definitely want that kind of quality, especially if you see demand increasing rapidly and contracting rapidly right where those spikes and an extra bandwidth and capacity you know just having that lower latency is probably going to be you know a critical factor in the long-term health of the network so again maybe it's one of those tweaks you start to consider when you know going through your iterations yeah yeah, I, I mean, I, I think there is definitely an argument to be made that the way that performance in particular is approached should be more sophisticated. I, I think the same argument can be made for, for price, maybe to a slightly lesser extent. Um, yeah, I, I think the performance should be treated in a, a more comprehensive way.
I mean, just, just an annual report. Obviously, I haven't completely thought about it. Of you know yeah, how many? Uh, what what's their what's the uptime for the last year basically? Of the network. No, yeah, he's saying orcs in general. If you're looking at performance, uptime would be a factor you should consider as well. Yeah, and swap rate, right? things like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, factoring in historical performance is, is is absolutely something that should be on the table. So that you know that provides a number like a sort of non-legal SLA to the to the broadcaster, letting them know, hey, this is how these guys perform in the last day or the two years before that. And as this data builds, that's you know that's more confidence for the broadcaster in, in, in choosing an orchestrator because now they have no more data to sort of base their decisions on. Yeah, and uh, so something I do also want to highlight as as this conversation goes on is like I do believe that a lot of the things that we're talking about around performance, especially historical performance, are going to be valuable for just about any broadcaster. That said broadcasters do have tools available to make these kinds of decisions in the short term, right? You'll recall that a few a few months ago, um, the concept of a block list was introduced. And if a broadcaster, for example, finds that certain O's are you know, repeatedly failing to follow through on their, this, their promised service, you know, they might find their way onto that block list. Um, so, so there are tools that are available to broadcasters, even if they're not enshrined in the so selection algorithm that's uh, the canonical representation in Go Live Beer. Right. And all I was suggesting is that we provide them with long term data, which they don't have access to because they're not using each orchestrator all the time. Yeah, but not every orchestrator is going to be accessing, or sorry, not every broadcaster has the same you know geographical regions as other broadcasters so the data you get from other broadcasters is somewhat unreliable no this is not from broadcasters i'm talking about you know like this vercel app which shows you the regions and your uh, segment duration segment received could we collect that data but and and you know show like an annual sort of report for it for each orchestrator that could be useful for broadcasters because they don't have access to that data and this is being collected as we speak anyways by life Yeah, I, sure. I, I guess anyone can do that, right? Uh, you can spin up a B and, and, and scrape data and collect it, and we can present it to potential. Well, you don't even have to. You can just, I, I mean, you could just um, you use the data that's already being, um, you know, posted on the Vercel app um, and make your own. Um, your own right. I mean, on, on each orchestrator's page in the Explorer, you could give them sort of a long-term sort of network performance rank based on this, not just you know, in the last three test segments that was sent. That could be useful for broadcasters from you know, looking at, a, you know, how has this guy performed over the last one year, two years and stuff. Or I suppose what you're suggesting is that the broadcaster would do it himself. Or it could be a third party service, you know, um, that, a, okay. that a broadcaster would subscribe to. But again, like that, that again, that, that, those tests are only from one broadcaster, which is, you know, essentially Live Peer Studio doing tests, but it doesn't it doesn't necessarily correlate to another broadcaster who wants to spin up a node somewhere else, right? It, it's it's accurate for what we have available currently. It doesn't it doesn't dilute the fact that it's still useful. Yeah, of course, of course. But it's that's already public info, so anyone can just spin up like a Prometheus instance and just like track, keep, keep that data from the, from the tester. Right. Yeah. You're right. Cool. Okay. Well, yeah, we've, we've definitely dug uh, quite deep into this. Do we have any other, okay. So we, we talked about price and, and the different dynamics of price. Uh, Let's talk about stream count. Um, Mike brought up the topic of stream count, and it, which is slightly different than price. Obviously, price affects stream count. But uh, Mike, do you want to do you want to give us a uh, an idea on your topic and, and what you are seeing for stream counts and what your yeah what your topics about? Yeah, no, just in general, like I said, if I set a hard coded value, you know, I can see you know a certain level of streams. If I go above a certain price. 
then I can see the streams disappear. So, you know, when I set when I settled in at a number, I pretty much see, you know, just a couple streams, you know, I think 400 or maybe 399. I, I got to go look, but I did a lot of testing. But whatever the number is, I just noticed that I can I can find, you know, at a low, a low enough price, I can find, a, a, you know, some way of getting streams. But I just didn't know if folks were used to seeing 20, 30 streams. Are they still getting that? Or if they're getting zeros or one most of the time, are they seeing more? And, you know, I just figured by changing my price, I can still kind of keep the same stream count that I had before. Well, yeah, that's my experience too. It, it, you have to go a lot lower price to stay about where we used to be, and it obviously related to a lot of you know differential price across the network. I, I've heard from some O's that that didn't have a lot of stake that you know they were able to set theirs very low on the price, and you know we're not seeing any you know what the same amount of streams that they used to get. Whereas it seems like O's with more stake are able to get back to where they were just at a much lower price. Um, I mean, just to add to that, one thing I, I did experiment with is I, I was writing a app, I wrote a little application that changes the price based off the amount of streams you have. Um, it's got a lot of testing to be done, but uh, you know, the idea is it's kind of a price discovery or if you think of it as um, like peak usage hours, like with electricity, uh, you know, I think something like that could go into go live pure on the orchestrator side and orchestrators could kind of set a target for that. You know, it would determine the price based on a range and kind of how many streams they want to have. Or maybe there could be a better metric like offered streams. Um, but just some ideas to try to, it seems like, you know, people set it really low and they just keep it there, you know, where it'd be nice if it was more variable with the volume. Yeah, I like that idea. I like the idea of adjusting your price based on demand. Um, and then and then that way you as an orchestrator can set your floor, which mm -hmm. you can do your financial calculus and be like, hey, like, you know what? I can set it to 50 and that's my floor and I will keep it there until we start reaching, you know, 50, 60, 70% capacity, in which case, you know, yeah, I need to start increasing it to either keep up with resources or to profit more from from the work I'm getting, and and so you know keep it, you know keep that threshold, and then you know once I get to a hundred, then I can really crank it up because yeah, I, you know I, I'm not gonna reject streams because I can't handle it. I'm gonna reject them because my price is too high, right? Like once you hit ninety five percent, that last five percent is not actually gonna be just me rejecting streams. I'm just gonna be having the price so high that that it's going to filter it out naturally right yeah exactly and, and then we could even get rid of that whole you know like like you you've already set like an auto max you know an auto max session you know kind of set up but you know maybe the max session thing on the orchestrator is is not really a you know you never even want to hit it you you want to you want a market approach to to 95 percent mm -hmm. right yeah, it would be really interesting to see the market dynamics if we had something like that in in Go Live Peer and everyone was was using it, um, rather than arbitrarily setting the price so low and kind of sticking with that. Um, yeah, but see, which brings me to to a question. Maybe Hunter can answer this. Hunter, uh, what do you think of about setting a, a a a price per pixel in a range and letting broadcasters choose, you know, orchestrators who within a particular range that they fancy or they they like instead of just you know, one hard figure, which, you know, can't fluctuate very easily because you have to literally restart a node to, to change that. But when you My say restart a node... The reaction is that the need to, to restart a node to change a config should probably be updated rather than the, the selection process. You don't need to restart a node for orchestrators to update their price, just FYI. Yeah. How are you doing it through uh, the life via CLR? Yeah, just you can set either price per broadcaster or you can just do 
uh, which is sets it per broadcaster, of course, or you can do the um, set, con is it 11? No, that's call reward. Uh, you just do uh, set orc config, whatever that one is. And the problem is it's yeah, not, it's, you have to like, configure everything. Yeah, you have to, yeah, you have to go through every step, which is really annoying. You have to do, and you have to not mess up. Otherwise it doesn't on chain transaction, which screws exactly. up. Exactly. So that, that's not, yeah, I would just do price per broadcaster, uh, and you won't, you definitely can't mess that up. So, just, okay. Which, which brings me to the second part of my question. Uh, a broadcaster is going to be open with, with all sort of dynamically changing price per pixel, because in that case, we can just offer them a range. So, so I'm not sure I fully understand what this would look like in practice, but I, I think like broadcasters have tools available to them to manage that as well. Right, like there, there are like there is still the notion of a a, a max price per pixel that a broadcaster is willing to pay, um, which like I don't think is super relevant right now, but it could become relevant if there are ranges involved, um, depending on what those ranges are. Okay. Yeah, I think there is a minimum price and max price on the broadcaster side. Um, and what my application does, it mostly works with the data, like the status endpoint um, and stuff that's the metrics that are already provided by Go Live Peer, but uh, it does need some updates. So I think it could go inside of Go Live Peer and be a, where the orchestrator sets their range and then it can move within that based off the amount of volume or, that it's getting. Uh, it's just one approach to it, but. Um, uh, the other concern I had, which I think was sort of addressed about, you know, like having slashing or um, block lists, um, is that it did seem like kind of risky. Like if someone was able to to just within a few minutes go to 80 streams, it just, I mean, feels like it's a large piece of the network. And if someone did that maliciously in a way, um, I would hope there'd be some performance controls to eliminate well, you said you can't you can't do that now. I think it only happened because the algorithm went in effect and some person went okay. low and then got all the streams because not everybody caught up yet. But now everyone's caught up. You go in there and lower your pixel to zero, you still won't get all the streams. Yeah, I, 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 if you're referring to me, I, I set that price per pixel like a week before this even went live. So like uh, okay. the, the second... They they press the button. I I was already at a eighty nine. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, even at thirty. I mean, I I know. I mean, I I had experimented with changing it too. I mean, even getting at the number that I got, it's it's a big difference from the normal, you know, amount of streams that come through. And I don't know if they're if if performance should be a higher factor in terms of the selection algorithm. I mean, price could probably still play a role, um, but it does seem like performance should be a little bit or there should be some limitation to the weight of that and, and maybe there just needs to be more adjustments but um yeah the variable price range was one approach i thought we could try to take and develop i like it cool question uh, ju this is just a question. Uh, I don't know if you guys can answer this or, or not, Dob or, or Hunter. Based on the change, have you guys seen like what is what is the cost to the broadcaster? Like, is, is there a like what is the cost reduction gone down to for for people on on the broadcaster side? Like, how much more affordable has this platform become based on this change and what the, the what has happened so far? Do you have that? Um, I don't have precise numbers offhand. Uh, I, I think that's probably best saved for like a, a community write up or like a like a blog post um, by by the the ecosystem group. Um, so so no reason not to share it. I just don't have the numbers handy. Okay, thank you. I, I can add a little to that. Um, just based on the payouts over the last week, it it looks like they're uh, and it's been trending slightly downward and then bounced up a little bit. But it's roughly half of what it was being paid out the week before. And I, this is a fairly small um, data sample, but just, uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. rough, roughly a, a half of what uh, the payouts were before. Gotcha. Is that, is, 
is assuming, that assuming there's the same amount of work i don't know what the what the work demand if that stayed the same but um is this uh, with the new update of the uh, estimated hours too? Um, is that is that based on the, you know the, uh, the, uh, the the new update where it's not just based on per, the amount that's paid out, but rather heuristics of of Live Peer Studio, and that's why maybe you'll see a decrease in in payouts, but hopefully not a decrease in in minutes transcoded per se. Yeah, like Hunter, I don't have. Any exact numbers um, in front of me? I know that the way the minutes estimation was built was that it was using some heuristic based on sort of the average um, price and and job type that's and profiles that uh, the studio broadcaster was using, as well as like some other sources. So it should it should be automatically updating um, as kind of as the way that you just described, Titan, where you know the minutes would not drop even though the price is price is dropping. Um, but that's a good thing to to follow up on and get some confirmation that that's taking this updated pricing into account correctly. Yeah, and just just for uh, just to complete my uh, my uh, the numbers I'm taking was off of um, Zoop's payout um, you know charts that just show um, you know all the payouts and just looking week to week uh, or, and actually day to day um, comparing each day to the week before. That's where I got my my numbers from. Yeah, it sort of matches the like estimated fees paid on paid on the Explorer too, which is over thirty five percent down in seven days. And you know, I'm not sure if the, the stream tester and some of the other sources um, have updated their their pricing model um, as well. But yeah, it's in, it's in line with what you shared, Papa Bear. Yeah, it's funny. I haven't looked at the Explorer for that part because. Maybe I'm just getting old, but the lines are getting so small in my, or maybe I need a better mouse pad, but I have a hard time hovering over a single bar at this point now that it's uh, yeah, we could use that. a we couple use years worth of data. <laughs> I, 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 like a, a blow, being able to blow that up to full size would really help a lot, or at least, or yeah. pick a range or something like that, but yeah. Cool, cool. All right, any last comments or subject about the price per pixel? or the price update algorithm. I know we've covered quite a bit of it. Um, yeah. Either way, I think it'll be very interesting to also, I think as a community of orchestrators, we should be putting out some financial plans around how we come up with price per pixels that makes sense for us, and then, and then publishing those rather than just looking at what the other guy's doing and you know just doing a little lower i know it's it's tempting to always want to go lower and, and and get those streams i know personally i get probably more excited by my stream count than my actual income uh which is kind of funny but seeing streams uh, i get pretty stoked uh, uh tickets are great but uh yeah seeing streams is pretty pretty cool um so yeah, maybe as a, if anyone wants to share any financial models they put together that can help, you know, break down cost of capital to deploy your GPUs, cost of bandwidth. Um, I know that's, that's an issue with my pool, which is I have to send, I have to receive the traffic and then send it uh, twice because I, I don't have to just take it in, do it and send it back. I have to take it in and send it to someone else and then take it in and send it back. So. I'm doubling up on my my uh, my traffic, which uh, costs costs money. So um, I have to figure out the the bytes per pixel and and maybe figure out you know how many pixels are needed to cover my bytes and then to cover the hardware and the blah 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 blah. And those can get pretty um, pretty fancy uh, spreadsheets. I think we can come up with where you know instead of just arbitrarily lowering it. We can actually start setting realistic prices around, you know, what is it that we would actually accept as orchestrators, and start building um, a market around, you know, some realistic numbers. And if people want to undercut, that's great. We can still play around, but at least having that that mental model of like where your number is uh, will help help uh, help us mature in in, in the coming months. Um, there's always a knee-jerk reaction when, when an update like this comes out. And uh, 
Yeah. So yeah. Learning how we can build financial models around how we become sustainable is going to help the network become sustainable and more attractive, I think in the long run. So yeah, if you have any, uh, modeling or, or spreadsheets you want to share, please, please do share them and, and we can plug in some numbers as well. Okay. Uh, with that being said, uh, we only have like one more topic, which was actually around my streamer idea. Um, I know that I actually looked into streamer for the first time, um, and started to try and figure out how I could supply real time data from my nodes to the streamer network and maybe earn some income from people that want that data, uh, rather than just, you know, looking at my Grafana where you can see a, you know, a, a just a, just some visuals on, on what I'm doing, but rather some real data and, uh, and maybe stream some, some, some income from that. So I was looking at it. Uh, it doesn't look like I, I, I got a little confused cause it's mostly like no JS stuff. Like it's mostly for like, uh, I guess apps, like, like the largest one on there is Binance. You can uh, you see all their updated prices on every single trade, every single second. Um, which uh, is very interesting. So you could subscribe to that feed and use that data in your own app or something, right? So I was just trying to figure out, you know, who, what, who would this be valuable for? Who would, who would benefit from seeing real-time data that you could aggregate across all nodes, all orchestrators, you know, things like that. Um, but I'm just not, not familiar with Node or, or JS for that matter, so. But yeah, if anyone wants to take a crack at it, I think it would be pretty interesting. Other than that, yeah. I, th I think the orchestrators should consider sending their stuff there. You know, hey, I do this work this time and start aggregating it that way because, as we pointed out a couple times, each broadcast is a little bit different or can be. So, having some data that's not central to one broadcaster would be pretty good. It's on my list too. I'd like to start playing with it so Titan we can mess with it at some point. I know. I know Mike has some experience with it, or at least he's, I think he's played with it a little bit. I think so we, we can we could even we build just, up. just a separate script where it's just pulling from the status or the statistics or metrics endpoint and just yeah. pushing that into streamer every second, right? And then and then that's it. Like it's not I don't I don't even think it needs to be built in to go live here. I think it could easily just be a, a separate module that does that. But again, yep. I'm not familiar with uh with how to deal with streamer. But I did set up my first stream and tried to push some stuff to it and it kinda worked. I don't know. Still still figuring it out. But yeah, anyway, just uh, some food for thought. Okay. Uh, any last comments, questions um, before we sign off? Yeah. Uh, why do we have the orchestrator and orchest uh, the transcoder split up into two binaries? Oh, yes. That's a great topic. I forgot to write it down. Yeah. Does, does anyone want to answer that? Also, we should talk about the, uh, the CUDA 11 toolkit patching that you need for Linux. I think I... Uh, one of my pool guys figured out how to do it without actually installing the entire toolkit. So, um, yeah. Does anyone want to take a whack at why we need two binaries? Drove me nuts. I mean, I think what uh, Chuck commented in the uh, uh, Discord, um, if you're running in a, a separate O and T, then you don't have to deal with you know um, all the uh, CUDA stuff for the orchestrator. Um, and then also, um, originally, I, I, if I remember correctly, Rafal made a comment about, um, I don't know who's still doing this, but uh, just if you're just doing CPU transcoding, that um, that's the one you would use for CPU transcoding. But again, I guess that's a good point. You were able to do that before without it. Uh, maybe just make it a simpler installation. Um, actually, the more I think about it, good question. I don't really know. It, right. And, just leave and the flags out. <laughs> yeah. The archive also ships with life via CLI, life via router, life via bench. I, I just don't get it. It's just, it's just so much more cruft. And 
I don't know. Uh, is anyone really doing CPU transcoding, especially with these new VOD requirements? Who who, who can afford to do CPU transcoding? I don't think anyone's I still doing Bitcoin with my processor. So I don't think anyone's doing uh, CPU transcoding, but we apparently have people doing CPU proof of work Bitcoin mining. So that's kind of crazy. But um, we, we, I think. I know that uh, I run uh, standalone O's, so I definitely don't want to have to be installing CUDA kit, you know, CUDA toolkits or or NVIDIA drivers, any of that stuff. But right now I don't have to, and and I, you know, you can still just leave out the transcoder flag, and it it's fine. So why is it any different? Like, search for those CUDA libraries as long as you have transcoder set to false. So that argument doesn't hold water. Like, you know, you won't have to install CUDA. Well, if I just said transcoder false. I wouldn't have to install CUDA anyways. Right. Why not ship another yeah. binary that's called LifePeer GPU or Transcoder or whatever, you know, or ch change their names. Stop calling them LifePeer. Call them Orchestrator and Transcoder. But these these two different uh, sort of archives that you have to do. And thank God nobody's packaging this for any distributions. Like, oh, you know, you know what? Yeah. That's a pain that in the ass. Because this is a breaking chain. What about a broadcaster? Could they just run that? Because they don't need to do any transcoding. So. But again, same thing. Just leave the flag out. I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah, I can't think of a good reason. Why? If you leave the flag out, it's not going to look for those files anyway, right? Like, why are they looking for the fly? If, if why are they looking for the files if the transcoder flag's not even active? And don't doesn't it already do that with the um, the startup function of the T? Like it it tries to to transcode one like on default and you'll get an out of memory error. Like you'll just get an error being like, hey, like no device found. Like how is it any different to be like, hey, no file found. So yeah, that's a good yeah, point. The more I think about it, the less sense it makes. I don't know. Uh, it's a, yeah, I guess uh, post the question and ask Rafal in uh, Discord. Because I think it's more of an issue where this thing was just rushed out and they didn't really think about, um, you know, hey, what are the... What are the reasons for doing this? Or you know, could we do this better or more efficiently? It's probably more likely. Because the funny enough, the Windows one only has one distribution. Like the Windows one doesn't have this separate binary, so that makes and it even more confusing. Well, it, it doesn't and support the uh, the the scaling though, but from the new uh, the new CUDA, the CUDA scaling either. So, um, so. Well, here's a little tidbit to add spice to the topic. I run the Docker image and it doesn't just differentiate. It just has one Docker image. So, and I have a O split and a T split. And all I do is specify the appropriate flags and it works appropriately. So I'm not sure why yeah. Linux was singled out. I, I think it's just a it's just a packaging issue. And they didn't sort of think of this. And they said, that's just how the CI scripts are written. It's just confusing, that's all. And now you have to update the documentation for all of it, and the files are called the same, and you've got two copies of the files with the GPU package and the orchestrator package. It's just... Uh... Yeah, and the, the old name is what sticks with the uh, with the, the non-GPU version, which is what most people are going to want, is the GPU version. So um, should have named the other one non-GPU or something like that if there was a reason. I just named the new, this one, you know, LifePeer as GPU or something instead of, you know, calling both LifePeer and you figure out which archive you got it from. Now, are these changes in the master branch yet? Anyone know? Yeah, it's released. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. released. Oh, okay. It's released. One, zero, seven, one. So I was looking and I didn't, you know, the, normally when we build it, we would, I think it's from the command folder slash live peer i would think if you're having separate binaries there would need to be a separate go file that it starts from but i'm not as familiar with go as some other people but i do think there's some value in creating like two different um i guess you say main classes or you know, entry points for both of those use cases because then the code kind of becomes a little bit cleaner I mean, it's already separated out quite a bit, but I think you know, like the startup functions for live peer, you know, it's a lot of, if this flag's there, then do that. Otherwise check for this flag. And it covers, you know, all these different use cases. It's kind of a kitchen sink thing, but um, yeah, it'd be interesting. I don't see a separate go file here for the GPU 
and the orchestra. Because I don't think that's where it's fleshed out. I think it's just uh, it's it's the CI scripts that are doing it, which is exactly I agree uh -huh. with you. Right, right. It shouldn't be different for for people using Docker and people mm -hmm. downloading the archives, uh, the the binary archive. Yeah, it's almost confusing that it's in it's in the CI, but it's not in the the code. The CI kind of obfuscates things a bit. Wait, so when you go to compile this new version, does it does it spit out two different files? One that's live peer, one that's live peer GPU. Do you want to try to build build the newest one? No, thank you. I'd rather slit my wrists and watch it bleed. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Seen that FFM big patch? <laughs> that that's the bit that really fucking. I'm just like I am not touching that shit. Fuck that. I have held off for a few weeks, so sinking my fork because of all the changes. But I will catch up soon. Believe it or not, and you guys are gonna laugh, but prior to this, I had several problems building. But with the new seven release, it worked perfectly for me. So I don't know what they did before, but now it works great. So if I had to go back to the old way. For whatever reason, I couldn't compile it, but so I'm not complaining, but I still empathize. Oh boy. Docker right now seems like the way if you want to run stuff without having to do any CUDA things on native Linux, because it just seems to work, right? Zoop, there haven't been any problems just kind of running an OOT or whatever you want on Docker, although the images are pretty big. Just, just know that if you do run it, throw in the runtime NVIDIA flag. Yeah. Uh, and and then, then it will work because uh, it took me for, forever. Got to have the NVIDIA runtime in there um, to make that work as well. So the Docker sees the GPUs. I was so hesitant to switch over to Docker. And now that I have, I can't believe how long I stuck around messing around with the binaries. It's just so much. Yeah. Docker's just. I've, like, I've been I'm listening to, to Mike yeah, talk about I'm it for sure. like. I've been listening to Mike talk about going to Docker for like, what, two years now? And I'm just like, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And then when shit broke this week, and I'm like, I guess I'm doing it. It's the, now's the time. So now I, almost everything I have is on Docker. It makes sense. Pain is the big motivator. I know that. <laughs> Learning through pain. Yeah, big thanks to Mike for helping get me going there. To what degree do we get that response from people dealing with the transcoding, right? It's like two years, you use live peer, two years, two, finally, ah, finally I'll switch. And it's like, oh, this is way better. Well, the, the best part is if you look at the old, the grants that I filed, they're still applicable today. They 100% work today. So if you just follow those grant videos that I produced and you walk through it, you will have a working system and no nightmares. Ooh, nightmares. Yeah, get you. <laughs> Halloween, the ghosts and goblins are everywhere. Dude, I, the only thing I'm going to have nightmares now is Avi slitting his wrists while at his computer. It's like, uh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so weird. Oh, man. Oh, that, <laughs> those two well, guys. he said what we all felt, especially when we started compiling. If you've ever tried, I mean, it is painful. So um, it, I like to laugh. He found it painful. I'm not even a developer. I was just like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't, I, I still, to this day, I still can't get it to work on, I can't install FFmpeg on Windows. Like, it just doesn't, just, I don't know, I can't get it. So. Windows is like 10 times harder. I mean, I, just, just by nature. Yeah, I had to use MSYS2 for that, which just adds a whole another layer. Definitely. It's been a oh. while, too. Okay, well, let's see if we can convince uh, somebody to not create separate binaries for Linux. That would be great. Um, let's talk about patching the, the CUDA kit, the CUDA toolkit. Um, so with this new 7 release, uh, we need the toolkit 11, I believe, um, to... Uh, it actually turns out to be 11.7 or higher now after I think enough people have been uh, successful with... 12 and ah uh, okay that adds to it and just as a, another side note to make sure folks are crystal clear if you look at the, the cuda uh 11.7 
um, documentation, it has a very specific driver version for Windows and for Linux. So you need to make sure you take note of the version requirement because it used to be like 515 worked everywhere. And I think with this 11.7, it doesn't. I, I think you have to be at 535, um, but just double check for your, you know, your specific graphic card. Oh, you need a specific or, uh, driver version? Yeah, there's a minimum requirement. If you look at the the notes, and I think it's right on the, the the main page of the of the release version when you go to download it, and it just says on the right hand side there's a spot that says you know if you're running you know the driver this is the minimum version you need to make sure it works. Oh boy, okay. Um, great. So I did have someone in the pool explain that instead of uh, installing the entire toolkit, which I guess is like half a gig, uh, you can just take the three files out of it and uh, throw them in, in a folder and link them to them, and, and it works. So Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's a good idea because I outside of the people using Docker, that brings us back to guys just unzipping this archive and sort of copying them as root to whatever directory and then running a, creating their own sort of system D units to start the service. That's that's just asking for trouble because you're gonna end up with craft lying around on different machines that you now don't remember where you've put. It's that's that's different why different versions just, is worse. Yeah, yeah, and then it becomes difficult to troubleshoot because you're like, why isn't this working? This should work because you actually got an older library file lying around there, which your package or your you know your this Debian's or Ubuntu's package has no idea who put this file here because it did not. That's that's a bad way to. That's asking for trouble basically. Maintenance issues on the don't do that. It's possible because they just need a couple of library files, but that's just, you're, you're setting yourself up for pain. Hey, I am pain. That's all I seek is pain. That's <laughs> why I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good advice. But, uh, yeah, anyone else having issues with the, with the patching or is it... Uh, Pretty much everyone's abandoning and going to Docker and living in a fairy tale life over there. Are we patching <laughs> anything? We're just, just installing CUDA. Yeah, just the CUDA. Yeah, just the CUDA toolkit. I think a couple of folks tried and they had some version compatibility issues. If you look at the the Discord issues, like or the chat history, folks were trying. You know, and some folks were running older operating systems and they were trying to get newer files that don't exist. Like, I think somebody was running like Ubuntu 18 and they were asking for support. So it's like, I think uh, if I'm not mistaken, Ubuntu 18 was released like in 2018 or something like that or 17 and they're looking for support. So, again, you got to upgrade your stuff in this in this day and age. Security vulnerabilities. I mean, there's a whole host of things and reasons why not to keep updated. I doubt even the U.S. Army could get a support package for Ubuntu 18. <laughs> <laughs> and they have a budget. There you go. Cool. All right. Any other comments, questions about uh, anything we haven't talked about or anything that we have talked about? No, but I while this uh, call was going on, I did drop my uh, price per pixel to 99, just hearing everyone's conversation. And... Uh, I did get some streams uh, in the U.S. and it's been sitting at zero for the past couple of days. Now I'm up to four streams. Very good. Yep. Now welcome to the live marketplace. Uh, if that's what you want to call it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll go ahead and end it there. Thank you, everyone, for coming and uh, joining this water coolers chat, where we uh, talk about all things live here. And uh, yeah, I have a mission to create live peers as the world's open video infrastructure. So thanks for coming. I'll try and get Victor on next week. Uh, until then, we will see you next week. Cheers. Oh, cool. thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.